this time on The Procedure. The human heart. Roughly the size of a clenched fist, this vital engine supplies nourishing blood to all corners of the human body. The heart is powered by coronary arteries that lie on its surface. If these arteries become blocked due to plaque or calcium, it can lead to a heart attack or even death. For much of human existence, there was no treatment for coronary heart disease. Heart patients were subjected to a life of bed rest, simply waiting to die. But thanks to pioneering physicians, surgical options began to appear in the late 1950s. Bypass surgery started repairing vascular issues outside of the heart. The invention of the heart-lung machine made performing bypass surgery possible on the heart. And by the late 1980s, balloons and stents emerged as a new non-invasive treatment alternative. Today, these endovascular devices are still being refined, techniques perfected. A giant leap has taken place in imaging that has allowed doctors to visualize and understand this disease even better. And for the first time in history, doctors are finally understanding and appreciating how the disease can manifest differently in women and among various social and racial demographics. Join us as we take you into the endovascular lab so you can see these new technologies and techniques firsthand. Advancements that are changing a death sentence to a new lease on life. The procedure is made possible by educational grants from Abbott Laboratories and Siemens Health and Ears. The brain surgeons were are considered to be the uh, uh, real leaders in, in those days. Uh, but then when heart surgery came along, we were cast in a different uh, role again uh, as uh, almost a genius quality. Well, I think one of the major developments was the development of the surgical treatment for aneurysms of the aorta, particularly the thoracic aorta. And we, we did the first successful operation for an aneurysm of the thoracic aorta here. During the time that I was in Houston, a lot of exciting things were going on, development of heart-lung machines, new kinds of equipment. We began to work on different methods of coronary revascularization and of course one of the things that was occurring then was the coronary bypass operation in very very earliest uh, stages. Almost every case that we operated on was a reportable case. It was new, it was different, uh, and uh, it was uh, uh, exciting and interesting to everyone. Welcome to The Procedure. I am Brad Perry here with Dr. Reisig, our second one that we're doing together. Absolutely. So this is exciting. What did you think of that last? That was amazing. That is history right there that you're actually a part of. Those were the pioneers. You know, if you think about it, those were the pioneers in Houston. Um, that's where a lot of the pioneering work in heart disease was. At the same time, the space race was really centered out of Houston. But when you saw DeBakey and Cooley, those are the founding fathers of heart disease management. And then you saw Dr. Dietrich, who's a disciple of DeBakey and Cooley. And I'm honored, I'm a, I'm a disciple of Dr. Dietrich. So I feel very much connected to, to what you just saw in that, uh, in that uh, clip. Yeah, does that make me now connected to yeah, them? Absolutely, I know you. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. You know, absolutely. Uh, just seeing that kind of history and now seeing what we're gonna be doing here with this, let's walk through this a little bit because this is such an important procedure, um, not just uh, now, but even going forward for some of these patients. Well, to understand what we're doing now, it's always important you have to understand where we were. 
These were rock stars. These open heart surgeons in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. You saw they were on the cover of Life magazine, America's Super Surgeons. Uh, that was the caption. Um, these doctors were so innovative, but almost everything that was being done up until the mid 70s was surgical. It was open heart, it was open chest. Really, by today's standards, more invasive. Now, open heart surgery is still a great technology, but, but that's the only thing that we had back then was open heart surgery. Yeah. About the mid 70s, about 1977, a Swiss radiologist, Dr. Grunzig, placed a small balloon inside a coronary artery and opened that artery and we were off to the races with this whole new catheter-based technology of balloon angioplasty and it eventually gave rise to stents and all of the modern technologies we have today. You know, uh, back when I first started uh, as a cardiologist, when I was in training, all we had were balloons. That was the only technology, that was the only non-surgical technology we had to open these blocked arteries. The problem, Brad, is that the arteries would close 30, 40, 50 percent of the time because you could dilate them with the balloon, but then the blood vessel would recoil. In 1994, the FDA approved stents. And as we talk, stents are very small devices. They look like a spring on an ink pen. They're about that size. And that was just inc an incredible leap in the technology for us to be able to maintain the integrity of the artery so the artery wouldn't close 40% of the time like it did with, uh, with balloons. Yeah. And then in 2003, yet another quantum leap forward in the technology where we began to coat the stents with, with drugs chemotherapy drugs, just like that which we use in, in cancer treatment. And by coating the stent in chemotherapy, uh, with a chemotherapy agent, we lowered the reclosure rates associated with treating arteries, treating coronary arteries, down to just a couple of percentage points. So it's been such a meteoric evolution from those surgical pioneers that you saw to modern stent technology. It, it's been remarkable. It's, it's been an incredible run. Yeah, I know we have a couple of stories that we're going to be uh, showing you out there. Um, but before we get to those, I want to talk very quickly the difference between women and heart disease and men and heart disease. There's nothing more important in the last 10 to 20 years, uh, more important than the recognition that women and men can present very, very differently. The classic chest tightness, chest pressure that we talk about associated with coronary disease, women don't always have those symptoms. Women can have very different symptoms. They can have shortness of breath, more subtle symptoms of discomfort in the arms, in the back of the neck, uh, sweating. When a woman comes into the office, and we're going to see some examples of this, when a woman comes into the office, you have to be vigilant. You have to listen to what women are, are saying to you because um, we've been programmed only to consider uh, what the symptoms are like in men. There was even a study called the Framingham study out of Framingham, Massachusetts, that suggested that women don't get heart disease. So we've really had to change the traditional thinking on men and women and heart disease. We, this is an, a, a change that was absolutely necessary several decades ago. Hi, my name is Ann, and I live here in Fountain Hills, Arizona. I worked many different varieties of nursing. My sister had cardiac disease. My mother had cardiomyopathy. Probably back in 2008, because of the cardiac history in my family, I had asked my primary physician if I could please have a scan done, and he did order a CT of the heart, where they found out that I did have some blockages. In October of 2017, I began to have problems with jaw pain. In fact, I had had two episodes of emergency room runs where I'd had tests which were always just not enough to prove that I had any problems. The 
jaw pain and the neck pain and the shortness of breath became more uh, of a problem to the point where um, I could hardly go out for a walk. So I did ask for another opinion. I went to a doctor who did a angiogram on me and found that I had severe heart disease. I was supposed to have open heart surgery, but then and when the open heart surgeon came in and said, I can't do it 100%. I can't do it, you don't have enough vein material. I said, well, you know, I just don't want to go through all of that and not have it done completely. So that's when I said, I will have to call in Dr. Reisig. He came in, of course, and said, sure, I can do it. <laughs> and, um, that's when it all started. Anne presented with left main coronary artery disease. The left main coronary artery is the main artery which supplies blood and nutrition to the heart muscle. A blocked left main coronary artery is a very high risk situation for a patient and performing left main coronary intervention is a high risk procedure. Previously, the only way to treat something like that was thought to be open heart surgery or a coronary artery bypass surgery. Now, with our technological advancements, with the skill set that we have, we can oftentimes treat this left main coronary disease without open heart surgery and can actually do it in a minimally invasive approach through coronary stenting. As part of her evaluation, we did an ultrasound or echocardiogram of her heart and I saw that her heart function was abnormally weak. As a result of this discovery, noticing that her heart muscle function was weak, we knew that she would be at much higher risk for complications related to doing a coronary intervention. To do the procedure, we had to put an Impella heart pump device so that we can support the heart muscle while we are doing this complex high-risk intervention. The Impella is a medical device that aids in the pump function of the heart in a patient whose heart is so weak that it may give out during a medical procedure. One of the other technologies that we used is called a rotoblader. A rotoblader is sort of like a drill. She had a severe amount of calcium in the coronary artery, so we literally had to drill or rotoblader through that calcium so that we could perform the stent procedure. Studies have shown that using the Impella device when you perform rotoblader or perform left main coronary intervention makes the procedure a much safer undertaking. Oh, I was back to it immediately. It didn't take long before I was able to walk and do normal chores without getting out of breath and no more neck and jaw pain. I just think that it's important that patients have doctors that listen to them and if they're not happy with one doctor that they should always move and get a second opinion. Heart disease is the number one killer and still is. Men have such a uh, a different symptoms and um, maybe they're listened to, but women uh, with heart disease just need to be listened to, especially if you have a family history. My plan is to live day to day and live for the moment. I'm here a year later to uh, show you that it does work. Doctor, what amazing story there is. Isn't that there. amazing? Oh my goodness. And, and imagine that literally right now they're just rewriting medical books for women with heart disease. Absolutely being rewritten so that there so that we understand that women have been underrepresented in terms of the diagnosis and management. There's definitely been a discrepancy, and we've only begun to learn that in the last decade or so. Yeah, so you're telling doctors out there listen to when women come in and talk about their, their chest pains or their problems that they're having. There's no question that the emphasis has uh, been placed on listening more carefully. Historically, when you talk about the chest tightness and the chest pressure, as you and I have spoken on the show, um, that may be more, uh, more representative of what men have uh, when they have uh, coronary disease. And was very typical of the symptoms women have 
but people just weren't listening. And I was blessed to get to know her. Wow, that's amazing. And we're seeing the technology change now, too, into making sure that people are getting taken care of the right way, especially what we're standing in front of right now. You know, you, you have really touched on a great point, and that is the technology. Our ability to, to image these coronary arteries, to look uh, at the, the greatest detail in the coronary arteries is, is very important. The x-ray technology we have from Siemens is phenomenal. Yeah, what do we have right here? Well, as you and I have spoken about, x-ray technology alone is not enough. And so we have the ability to look at the coronaries in very, very uh, minute detail. This is called OCT, or optical coherence tomography, and it is an infrared type technology where we're not only looking at the arteries from the outside of the body as it is to the left, but we can go inside the artery with a small camera and look at great detail in the blood vessel. This is what the normal blood vessel looks like. The vessel is made up of multiple layers of cells packed together, and you can see these layers of cells uh, packed together in this image. So as we are looking at the blood vessel uh, on this picture here from the outside, this is looking at a really a normal artery on the inside. And, and so we use OCT um, when we are uh, performing stent procedures. And I want to show you just how valuable OCT can be. Once we place a stent, we want to optimize or perfect the stent placement. It's more than just, just putting a stent in. We want to perfect the stent placement. We want to make sure when we place a stent, as you see here, these are these little markings as you see all around, that's the stent up against the vessel wall. If we fully expand the stent and it's up against the vessel wall, as it's shown here, full, full expansion, those patients usually have a very durable result. Those are the patients who are less likely to come back with stent closure. But we can use this camera to look at other areas. Now look at what we're seeing here. We see here the stent is not fully expanded. In fact, it looks like it's just hanging out in the middle of the blood vessel. If we don't optimize that stent expansion, go in there with another balloon. When we see this stent not fully expanded, those are the patients who may come back with stent closure and need another stent procedure. We call that instant restenosis in, in medical terms. We want to avoid a stent not optimally deployed, and you can see that is not an optimal stent expansion, whereas right here, the stent is optimally deployed, and that's something that we want to try and achieve when we place a stent. Wow, and we're gonna see this in the operating room. This is from Abbott Vascular. It's called Optical Coherence Tomography, or OCT, and we're gonna show you several pictures like this when we do our procedure. We use this every day. Wow, this is amazing, doctor. All right, let's switch gears a little bit, and let's talk about this next patient. I know where you're going. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, we have great technology, but sometimes it just boils down to the human touch, humanity, and how we touch people's lives just through our effort. Forget the technology for a minute. Sometimes it's just not giving up on a patient. It does not appear that there's any kind of a, an effort up there yet. Now remember, oh my God. Oh my God. That looks like a second plane. 16 years ago on the first anniversary of 9-11, I had this heart attack. Think for a minute what you were doing on the first anniversary of 9-11. I know my family and I had just gotten back from a memorial service at church and we had just gotten home and I was sitting um, at the piano with my eldest daughter and I got the call from the emergency room that a patient had just arrived and he was having a heart attack. My dad, he passed away quite a, quite a few years ago. He had a massive heart attack he went, lay down in the bed, 10 minutes later, he was gone. And, but he was sweating, 
just sweating to beat the band. It kind of stuck in my head. So 2002 on 9-11, all of a sudden I started sweating. And I thought, uh-oh. I said, okay, Diane, let's go. We gotta get we gotta get some help because I remember my dad sweating like this. I need to get some help. Something's going on. And we didn't even call 911. Get me there as soon as you can. And I was in there for about 10 minutes answering their questions and all of a sudden my eyes rolled right back in my head. And I was gone. Two first responders who happened to be in the emergency room saw his eyes roll back in his head and he uh, suffered a cardiac arrest. And it was amazing. They just jumped right in. They didn't hesitate, they didn't wait. We had started doing CPR in the emergency room and these two first responders came with us up to the cardiac catheterization laboratory because we didn't have a full staff there yet. And they did CPR on this patient who was completely flatlined with no blood pressure and no pulse for over 45 minutes. Most patients that have cardiac arrest and have a rhythm that is a flat line or asystole usually die. I think within the context of this being the first anniversary of 9-11, uh, they knew their brethren in New York didn't quit and they weren't going to quit. They were dripping wet, they were sweating, they were exhausted, they were fatigued, but they didn't stop. They weren't going to give up on this patient. It was truly one of the most amazing things in my professional career to witness. If you've ever done five minutes of CPR, you would understand how exhausting it is to do 45 minutes of CPR. I was a soccer player during uh, my college years, and 45 minutes is an entire half of a soccer game. So doing CPR for 45 minutes is pretty remarkable. As we moved along in the case, after about 45 or 50 minutes, all of a sudden, we saw a blip on the screen. And, and then one blip was followed by several more, and we, we realized we had a rhythm back, and before long, we had, a, we had a blood pressure back. And as he began to stabilize, I, I wish you could have seen the look on those two first responders. They were elated, they were ecstatic. I think the fact that it was 9-11 was all the more special for them. I just feel fortunate that I'm even sitting here right now because if it wasn't for Dr. Reiser and those two paramedics, I would not be sitting here right now. Uh, one paramedic came up to my room and I really wanted to thank him. I actually wanted to you know, take him out for dinner or whatever. He said, no, this is what we do. And he said, we're just gonna leave it at that. What an amazing story that Jerry was going to die 16 years ago, but he's had a whole new life since then. From the time that I was released from the hospital up until now, which was 16 years, um, I've been able to actually see all three of my grandchildren. I would have never been able to see them at all, and they never would have been able to see their, you know, their grandfather if I didn't make it. This has given him a second opportunity at life. This reads like something out of a Hollywood screenplay. In my own personal career, this is not something that I could ever anticipate happening again. This is beyond what we normally expect from anybody providing CPR. Some of us are extraordinarily fortunate that the right people are around at the right time. And I think in, in Jerry's case, that was definitely the moment to have two people like the firefighters help him, as well as some, one of the best cardiologists in the country right there to help him as well, I think are the keys. And then it can show that you know, even people who are critically ill, if we give them a chance and they recover, they can go on to enjoy great things in their life and even accomplish more than they ever thought was a, possible before. I have no problems. The stent is still in me, the same stent. I, I just been enjoying life. Uh, I look at life a lot differently in this past 16 years um, because of this situation. This 
was a big awakening as far as my life was concerned. Welcome to another procedure with Dr. Reisick and his wonderful team here. Uh, doctor, um, this is such an important uh, procedure we've been talking about because um, you know the history behind this. It's amazing. Before we start, let's introduce the team again. Well, we have a great team. We have a lot of, of clinical support from, from industry, from Abbott Vascular, from uh, our friends uh, at Shockwave. We're going to do a, a very interesting balloon dilation. Uh, we're going to use an Abbott Vascular Zion stent, one of the time-honored great stents in our armamentarium. We're going to do some imaging with OCT. You know, if they say it's not fun to sing alone, it's not fun to do intervention alone. I got uh, my partner for many years, Dr. Mullick Shaw. Dr. Shaw heads our, really heads much of our program while I direct the lab, Dr. Shaw heads our program. And we're gonna have Dr. Bimal Padalia in a minute doing some of the high resolution imaging. Uh, and it's great to have you. We have Mallory right next to us and an ensemble in the room. Uh, and then the other thing is, uh, so much of the support for our education and research program has come from Siemens. They've really helped to sponsor uh, these, these live events. So our friends at uh, Siemens Health and Air, we're, we're just so uh, appreciative to them. Well, I'll tell you, we are very appreciative because this has been a life saving for a lot of our viewers, a lot of people watching. So let's get right to see what we're seeing right now on the screens. May I orient you to how we are? So Dr. Shaw has the what we call the access. He's got the catheter in the blood vessel. Dr. Shaw, you want to point out what you've done? Yeah, so absolutely. So when we need to get to the heart, to the blood vessels that are feeding blood to the heart, there's two access points that we historically go through. One is through the leg, but, and the other one is through the wrist. When we go through the leg, it's great, but sometimes people have to stay in bed for a long period of time afterwards or they can bleed from their leg, and that can be catastrophic. Dr. Rizek actually maneuvered a catheter through the wrist, through a very s tiny, tiny incision through here, and then we were able to go into the heart here right now. So what we have right now... Well, let me just one minute. Yes. So the head of the bed is this way. This is the foot of the bed, and you can see that the access site is actually in the wrist. So we've gone up the wrist all the way to the heart, and we can access all the arteries of the heart right through the wrist. Wow, and as we were showing before we, we came into the surgery room about this procedure and how it's important now instead of having to go in and do a full bypass. Well, this is not bypass surgery. This is not an open chest procedure. Um, historically, this type of procedure four arteries would have been a quadruple bypass, would have been the domain of the surgeons. Absolutely. Before, when you have multiple vessels that need to be fixed like that, surgery was the only option for patients. And so now, with this coronary stenting procedure, we can get people recovered faster, recuperating faster, and feeling better with a tiny, tiny incision, just like the one we've shown you here. Wow, it's amazing. Well, if you look at the screen, Brad, you can see the blockage that we're looking at. Could we get a stop action with the artery completely full? We are injecting contrast. Now toggle back, perfect. That's contrast that we've injected in the artery. And you can see that this artery, this right coronary artery, is a C-shaped artery. And right in the middle of the C, you can appreciate there is a blockage. When you compare that area of blockage to what we see high up in the vessel, and more distal in the vessel, that's about a 90% blockage. Yeah, absolutely. And this is a really important artery because it feeds all of the blood to the bottom of the heart. And so we really want to make sure that that bottom of the heart gets enough blood flow. So, so what we're going to do, we're going to proceed with first ballooning it, dilating it. We showed you what stents look like. We're going to stent it in a minute. That stent is a scaffold. It's like a spring on an ink pen. And we're going to scaffold the vessel open. And then we're going to bring Dr. Pedalia out here to do some imaging to show what the vessel, we were looking at the vessel from an x-ray on top. This is the x-ray tube. And we're looking at it from an x-ray outside the chest. Dr. Pedalia is going to show us what it looks like from inside the vessel with what we call optical coherence tomography, or OCT. So with that, that is where you're gonna go in and you're going to actually open that up so it can start flowing more. Now, is, is there actual blood flowing right now, but not as much, is that what the problem yeah. is? Now it's blood flowing through there, but if this gentleman were to go jogging, he would, when, when the heart rate increases and you need more blood, what would happen? So when you need more blood and there's a blockage, there's not enough blood flow that can go through there, and then people can get chest pain, shortness of breath, 
feel like they can't do as much. And so that's why it's really important to fix these blockages when they're severely tightened. What causes these blockages, doctors? Well, complicated, complicated formula. First of all, it's about fat and cholesterol, plaque, but that's only part of it. Coronary disease is about inflammation, and people develop an inflammatory process. They develop inflammation inside the blood vessel, and that can, uh, can predispose. The older you are, the more calcium you may have, diabetes, smoking. It's a complex cascade of events which leads to the development of disease. And in his case, he had four arteries blocked. This would have been a quadruple bypass. Absolutely. Absolutely, and that would have been uh, something that would have had a long recuperation period. And let's remind people, before this actual technology right here, you guys were actually going into opening up the chest and the heart to do this type of surgery. In the old days, most of these types of procedures were bypassed, were open chest procedures, and now we're going into the wrist. So. Now, because there is calcium in this artery, we're going to do something unique, something new. You know how when a person has a kidney stone, uh, the they, uh, doctors can use lithotripsy, shockwave lithotripsy to break down the calcium. Dr. Shaw, when you see calcium here, what, what does that mean when you try and do an angioplasty or a stent? So that makes it more difficult. So you can imagine if you're putting a balloon or a stent into something that's very rigid, it makes it more difficult to put in that stent. And then sometimes if you don't treat that calcium well in advance, you don't get as big of a stent that you can put in there. And that leads to an increased risk for a reblockage or a stent that's not completely opened up. And so that's why it's really important to one, recognize that there is calcium and then two, try to treat that calcium in advance. So it's sort of like bone growing into the arteries. Okay, so what Dr. Shaw is going to do is he's going so to advance a lithotripsy balloon and we're going to administer shocks inside the vessel to try and modify that calcium to open that calcium. Go ahead, advance it. And that's our balloon. It's, of course, it's in a deflated state. Looks like it's close to where we want it yeah, to be. Yeah, I think that's perfect. Wow. Wow, bring it back very just good. A touch. Okay, now Mallory's going to step in and she is going to inflate the balloon, and I'm actually going to administer shocks or shockwave lithotripsy to the. Uh, okay, ready? Go negative. Now, Brad, watch what we do and go up to four atmospheres. And now you're going to hear some shocks as we go in and try and pulverize the calcium. Wow. Now, you hear those beeps? Yes. And I see the little piece moving there. Is that what we're seeing? Now it's opened up. The balloon is opened up due to the shocks. Okay, and down, balloon down. Now we're gonna give a little bit of rest. We're gonna allow blood to go through the vessel again. We're gonna wait a second. And let's just give him a few seconds to recover from the first balloon inflation. And we're gonna do another lithotripsy run. Let me just inject a little contrast, go live. So, okay, come back just a hair. Perfect, all right, go back up. Come up at four. There it is, oh, there you hit it that time, that's great. Wow. So watch. We're gonna do one more after this. I think we'll do a series of three. And balloon down, please, okay. We've done two inflations. We're gonna let him rest. Sometimes what we can do is we can watch his EKG and as we inflate our balloon, remember we're, we're obstructing flow, we're blocking flow into the vessel. And, uh, and so they might have a little chest pain, they might have some EKG changes. That's perfect, mullet, go up right there. We're gonna go up with the balloon again. You can see the balloon inflating. Yeah. And now, again, I'm administering shocks to the vessel. You did a great job. I think you hit it right on the money there, sir. And down. Okay, we're gonna take this balloon out. So, Floro, retrieve it. Is it down? Yes, sir. Okay, good. So now we're gonna take the balloon out of the vessel. So what we've done is we've pre-treated the blockage before stenting. We don't wanna, wire. We don't want to try and put a stent in where there's an obstruction. And so what we're going to do is take the balloon out now after pre-dilating it. We'll take a picture to show what a good job Dr. Shaw has done with his balloon angioplasty. And then the next thing will be to put a stent in.
And now with putting that stent in, that's going to leave it open, as you were saying. It's almost like uh, pushing everything aside so it can move much. That's right. It's, it's a scaffold that will help to maintain the integrity of the vessel. When all we did was balloon angioplasty several decades ago, we could get the vessel open like this, but about 30, 40, even 50% of the time, the vessel would recoil and close, and the patient would have to come back for another procedure. Now with stents, the closure rates... Uh, especially, you know, with the Abbott stent, the Zion stent that we use, the closure rates are low single digits. They usually stay open. So compared to our last procedure, this is moving kind of quickly. Is that just because of the type of, of surgery this is? You know, it's the type of surgery it is. Dr. Shaw and I have uh, worked together for many years. We know each other's movements. And so this is, you know, a lot simpler. So what we're going to do now is take another picture and see what the balloon has done. Wow. Oh now, my goodness. That looks fantastic. Now let me just tell you something. Wow. If the year were 1990, before we had stents, we would probably be slapping each other high five, walking off and saying, look how great this is. Yeah. Now I want you to look. It looks better than it did, but we're going to improve the result even more by putting that stent in. Now watch how, how much better of a result we can get. 3533, please. Now, I hear you calling out numbers a little bit. What are those numbers you're calling out? <laughs> okay. So the stent, I said a 3533. Mean, that means the stent, when we dilate it, it's going to be about 3.5 millimeters in diameter and about 33 millimeters long. Now, when you zoom up on that, look at it in relation to my finger, that's the stent right there. That shows you just how small these coronary arteries are. Now, it's the difference between stenting and, and surgery. The surgeons use magnifiers to see. We, we magnify our picture on the x-ray with x-ray machines. Yeah. Okay. Isaac, you so, want to talk a little bit about what, uh, the, uh, what's coded on the stent? Great point. Well, yeah. why don't you? So, you know, historically, these uh, metal objects are great in opening up arteries, but sometimes you can have tissue that forms on them over age and time and cause a reblockage. And so um, industry and innovation has been fantastic in finding actually a drug coating that can go on these metal objects that allows for less of a reblockage rate. So in fact, it's decreased the risk of reblockage from about 20% down to less than 5% at times. So that's fantastic. So, so initially, the stents were just metal, and now they're drug-coated metal. And what's very interesting about this is the initial drugs used were just chemotherapy drugs. The same chemotherapy drugs that we used in cancer chemotherapy to prevent cancer from cells from regrowing, this will help to prevent the the cells from regrowing inside the stent and the stent closing. So we have this scaffold which keeps the vessel open and then these anti-inflammatory chemotherapy drugs uh, to keep the vessel open. So, so Dr. Shaw has just advanced that. Uh, he's done it flawlessly. He's done a beautiful job. And I want people to understand on your screen when you see the two different black marks, that is the stent. That is the actual so understand, stent. That's the actual stent in there. That's the borders of the stent. And that helps us use x-ray to identify exactly where we want to put the stent. Wow. So now look at the picture that we showed you before. I'm going to show you how the vessel looks now. That's perfect, Malik. That is absolutely perfect. Okay, wow. so now watch what we do with the stent. This, as we dilate it, will end up, push the table away from me just a little bit. Away from me, perfect, perfect. So I'm dilating it slowly, and you'll see the stent, the balloon on which the stent is mounted, yeah. start to dilate, start to dilate. Now it's fully expanded and looks very good. All right, would you take a cine and let's Absolutely. show Absolutely. Okay, now look at that. So that's a lot. That is a lot bigger than what the blood vessel was after we just ballooned it. What Dr. Shaw is going to do now is he's going to withdraw the balloon, and the stent is still there. Now let's take a picture, shall we? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so with the stent in place, now watch what it looks like. Wow. That's beautiful. So go back oh, to pictures, and just for the audience at home, go back, go back. Now... This is what it looked like. It's still a little bit irregular. Go forward a picture. This is with the stent being inflated. Go forward another picture. With the stent fully inflated and in place, 
those irregularities are smoothed out, the vessel looks fantastic. Now, I said that the stent was gonna do a better job. I think we can even do a better job. I told you the stent was a 3.5 millimeter stent. What we're going to do now is put a four millimeter diameter balloon and now we're gonna try and make the vessel oversized because the more we oversize this, Brad, the less likely it is that our patient is going to come back with the vessel closed. So are you putting another stent in? Or we're gonna put just a balloon and now expand this stent even more. God. So we had a stent on a balloon, we put the stent in place, and now we're gonna put a larger balloon. We're gonna go from three and a half millimeters to four. Yeah, and everything's flowing much better. They're going to be able to move and, and exercise and be much healthier. No, no question. So what Dr. Shaw has just done flawlessly, again, I might add, is he's put the balloon inside the stent. Why don't we take a cine to see where we're at? Sure. Run it forward. Okay, negative. So go back to Tad. Okay, happy? Yeah. All right. Let's so now... Here. We've got a balloon at three and a half, or a stent at three and a half millimeters inside the artery, and now we have a four millimeter balloon that we're going to blow up and expand the stent even more. Wow. For those watching at home, if you just saw what that happened, you saw the balloon open up a little more to the stent. So now he's going to pull it back a little bit so that we dilate the entire stented segment. Let me just in just, just a second here. I'd go in just a tad, just a tad in. Perfect. Uh, Dr. Shaw and I have worked together for so many years. Uh, uh, sometimes we do this and we don't even <laughs> Hand talk. Hand in glove. <laughs> yeah, All right, and now you see the balloon. Now you see that balloon expanded and it's expanding the stent. Okay, so. I think the next step is for us to put a camera. Now you've seen all these pictures from a, a, an x-ray camera from on top of the, uh, the patient's body. Now let's put a camera inside and see what it looks like inside the blood vessel. Wow, so like what we were doing outside here. Absolutely, what we showed you before we came in the lab. So, wow, amazing. So Brad, the, the number one thing that patients ask me all the time is how long will my stent last? And two things that Dr. Isaac and the whole team are doing here, which are really crucial, are one, making sure to prepare the blood vessel extremely effectively with that shockwave technology that sort of actually opens up that artery with the lithotripsy. And then the second thing is to image it afterwards to make sure that the stent is perfect. Because if we, we want to make it just right right now, and that decreases the chances of ever having to need another stent in the future. So, so Brad, I'm, I'm pleased to introduce one of our colleagues and a close friend. Dr. Bimmel Padalia. Dr. Padalia will be over here in a second, but P Dr. Padalia, yeah, well, what is it that we learn from OCT that helps us to optimize these stents, to make these stents stay open or, or to be durable so that they don't close down? That's a good question, David. So what OCT allows us to do, especially in 2020, is not to guess on the stent size anymore. It's like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. You want, it, you, you want the stent size to be precisely right, not too small, not too big. And we know that through studies that when you do get it close to exactly right, it decreases the risk of further heart attacks in the future and, prob and problems with the stent. That, that's, that's a perfect explanation. So we have the OCT in. Fluoroscopy is great. We have used fluoroscopy for decades to, to look at these vessels. But fluoroscopy alone is not enough. There are limits to what, how well we can see uh, the blood vessel with fluoroscopy. And as Dr. Padalia said, putting this tiny little infrared camera in really, really does give us more uh, ability to image and to perfect the stent implant. So how big, how big is this little camera that's going in there? About the same, it's smaller than the stents that we put in. Wow. Okay, let's do an OCT run, ready? Tell me when you're ready. Hold it. So I'm auto calibrating. You purged Flush. a little bit. You're well engaged. Is that right, Malik? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Say yeah. that again, Bibble. Yeah. You're well engaged. We are. Yes. Okay. We are. Yeah, and we are. what's the uh, assist on? I'm going to leave Zero it a rise. Okay. Here. Are you okay with that? Okay. Ready? So this is how we get the OCT image. I'm going to bring yeah. it back. Enable pullback. That. Yeah. 
And if you'd floro, save that for us. Okay, watch the rhythm. Okay, why don't you come back? Good image. Now, Dr. Padalia, I, I, I really want you to explain this because uh, you, you explain this so well. Talk to us about the image we're looking at and the stent and whatnot. You tell everybody in the audience just exactly what you're seeing. So we basically have put a very small camera into the artery. It's as if, you know, we've shrunk somebody, become like Ant-Man, and are swimming through the artery here. So on the left-hand corner, you can see the fluoroscopy or the x-ray image that we've been looking at. And then to the right, you're actually swimming through the artery um, as, as uh, going from the far part or the distal part to the proximal part, the near part. And these spokes that you see, these white dots, they kind of look like bicycle spokes. That's the actual stent that's been put in. And as we interrogate or look at this very closely, what we can see is how well did we place the stent in the right position and how big did we make it? Did and, we make and, it and, significantly and, and large? Right, I'm sorry to interrupt you, and it's right up against the vessel wall, isn't it? Exactly. It, the, the stents, um, uh, the metal part of the stent is right against the metal wall, uh, which you can see right here. Um, and then the important part is how large did we make it? Did we make it sufficiently large enough? Um, and these numbers in yellow here tell you that we're 99% expanded here, 87% expanded there. And we know that the studies show if you're more than 80% expanded, that you've done a very, very good job and that this stent may last the patient for a long, long time. So all I did was talk. Dr. Shaw did all the heavy lifting. He, <laughs> he expanded the stent. But what we can conclude from having this tiny camera inside, we can see things that we couldn't see with x-ray alone and we can conclude based on your measurements that this is very, very unlikely to ever close, correct? That is correct. This is how stents should be placed in 2021. So um, if as long as this patient stays, now we just put a piece of metal in the artery. And so we're gonna ask this patient to be on blood thinners, two blood thinning agents for six months to a year. As long as he stays on uh, those blood thinning agents, Dr. Shaw, chance of closing is the low single digit. The risk is very, very low if somebody's taking their medications regularly, which is great. So let me ask, we just saw the imaging. Now, say for instance we got through and, and the numbers weren't right where they were supposed to be. Do you go back in and you, and you maneuver so those numbers are just right? Uh, absolutely, we'd touch it up to make sure that we're expanded perfectly and go back in with the camera to make sure that we've actually done it perfectly as well. Dr. Padalia, maybe you can talk about some of the upcoming artificial intelligence uh, with this device and it tells you just how much you should expand it, right? Exactly, it, it's similar to having maps in the past and then having a map that talks to you and tells you exactly what to do. So the next level technology with this software, OCT, when you do a run, it will actually tell you what kind of plaque do you have? Is it lipid or cholesterol rich? Or is it calcific that you may need something like the shock wave that we used? And then number two, it will correctly measure the actual dimensions of the stent to tell you exactly what diameter and length stent to use. So we might have used a four millimeter balloon with the, the next renditions of this, the next iterations of this, it might tell us you used a four millimeter balloon, now go up to a four and a half millimeter balloon or a five millimeter balloon to optimize your results. So we get real time feedback. It's nice to have Dr. Padalia, you know, in there. It's nice to have Dr. Shaw in here. But if I were here by myself, this would be giving me real uh, time feedback as to what the next steps are. Wow, amazing. So wait a minute, you wanna have some fun? Okay. Bimmel, can you do a 3D, look at this. So Bimmel, wow. do a 3D rendering for us to show the kind of images you get with this. Exactly, so let me make this picture a little bit bigger if I can. Here we go, so as we move through this vessel, and I'll um, zoom in here, you could see the actual wire that has been placed into the artery. Just that, that, now that's that tiny wire, fluoro a minute. 
that tiny wire you see running the length. Right. Now show them the wire on the on your three D imaging. Right through here. Yes. This straight Isn't that line. Amazing? Here. This small. That right here. that is the stint, or is that that's this, the wire? That's, that's the, the wire, wire that we've been using. That's the this. If right you can here. if you yeah. can zoom in on the table. The wire that's running through the blood vessel is about as thick as uh, one of our hairs on our head. Um, and no that's way. what you're seeing on the screen, that big wire running through the vessel. That is so incredible that that little piece is, is what's pretty much Point zero 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 one four millimeters. Yeah, this yeah. is yeah. 14 thousandths of an inch, and that's what we can <laughs> oh see. Oh, my on. gosh. Okay, so now he's moving up, and we see the... Now you see the, the stent. Part. That's the stent. So these uh, struts is what we call it. Um, is of the metal stent that was placed. And you could see on this 3D image that it's nicely hugging uh, the wall of the artery it as well. beautiful. And that's what we really want to have. That's what we want to have. Okay, we are going to take a final picture, and then I think we're going to take some questions. Yes. All right, let's see what we have. Last picture. Looks phenomenal. Looks beautiful. Uh, the chance of this closing uh, is extraordinarily low. And I got to tell you, it is always uh, it's my pleasure to work fun with you. <laughs> working with you, Bimmel. I always get a lot out of what you teach. L look at that other image that, that uh, Dr. Amazing. Padalia is showing us now. That's right the, down the barrel of the blood vessel. The before and after is very impressive here. Yeah. Wow. That's the ant man swimming through the artery. There it oh, is. Right there. Yeah, all right. Amazing. So we're going to take a final picture with all of the equipment out. Wow, that's beautiful. Look Gorgeous. at that. Now. Okay. Remember that we went in through the wrist. Can you zoom up here? We went in through the wrist. So we're going to take this band. Uh -huh. Maybe you can zoom in on our TR band. We are going to take this band, wrap it around his wrist, take the catheters out. We're going to do that so he doesn't bleed. When is he going to be able to get up? Almost immediately, right after the procedure, in wow. a few and, seconds and, here. Yeah. And when are we going to send him home? Uh, later on today, this afternoon. If everything looks good, he should be able to go home. That's amazing. That's, that's incredible. So <laughs> that was the patient cheering. <laughs> so as we step over here, okay, if a stint has been put in and someone needs another one, do you take the other one out or you just put another one in in place of it nearby? That's a, that's a very good question. And sometimes when the stent closes, we do have to telescope a new stent inside the old one. And that's, that's uh, the key point. We never take the stent out, but if this stent closes, we telescope a new one in and we will uh, try and expand this. But all the time when a stent closes, there's got to be a reason. So when that happens, we always use that OCT or an ultrasound camera to look and figure out why the old stent closed. Was it underexpanded? Was it uh, malplaced when we uh, put it in? So it'll be very important not just to use x-ray, but to use those specialized camera like Dr. Padalia just demonstrated when a stent closes. We never pull the old stent out. We just telescope a new one in and overexpand it. Okay. Can you do a stent after a bypass surgery if someone needs to? All the time, absolutely. Very often patients who had bypass surgery uh, uh, in, in the 90s or, or even uh, you know 20 years ago, bypass grafts do have a, a, a rate of closure. Some people say two, three, four percent a year. When bypass grafts close, we can either go in and stent open the bypass graft or we can go and in and open the original vessel, the God-given artery, that was originally bypassed. So it's very often that we do these types of procedures on individuals after they had bypass. Now I wanna be very clear, bypass surgery is a superb technology and it's been around for four or five decades. But I think it's a complementary technology with stenting. Dr. Shaw and I and Dr. Padalia sit down with our surgeons all the time and, and determine is this patient uh, better for bypass or better for stenting? So um, the difference between a man and a woman having this procedure because we know that, you know, heart problems run differently. Well, first of all, the symptoms leading up to this procedure, as you and I have spoken, can be very different. So you must be very vigilant when you are determining uh, if a man or a woman needs a cardiac catheterization uh, or a stent procedure. The symptoms leading up to this can be different. 
Um, the biggest differences we see between men and women in the cath lab is uh, uh, arteries on men are a little bit bigger than the arteries on women. And that's why it's so important to do all, take all of these steps, do all of this imaging to make sure you're perfecting the stent procedures. The only other thing I would say is, you know, some of these patients can have bleeding complications. We're putting a hole in an artery, we're giving them blood thinners. Women tend to have more bleeding complications than men. Elderly women uh, have more uh, bleeding complications than younger women or younger men. So uh, there are some differences in the procedure, uh, but you wanna be compulsive and meticulous about your work, being very careful, paying attention to everything going on in the room. It becomes second nature for Dr. Shaw and I uh, doing these, uh, so many of these procedures together. Um, like I said, sometimes uh, we may not even talk during the procedure, each one of us has a role, uh, but you must pay strict attention to everything going on in the room. You know, I'll turn this one over to Dr. Shaw here. Um, what about the social um, economics and, and difference in, in, of course, heart disease and what you guys do? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, many people avoid care for a long time for their cardiovascular health. And oftentimes people who don't have access to health care, people um, who may not have access to health care come in at a later stage in their heart disease. And so they oftentimes need more therapy because they've already had severe blockages or not on the right medications already, or their blood pressure or diabetes is not as well controlled. Mm -hmm. And so I think we've learned that we need to be more proactive at preventing heart disease. So in those particular communi communities, we look very heavily in making sure that they're on the right medications, doing all the right things that they can do to prevent heart disease. Yeah. The most important thing for us to do as we go forward is to recognize those discrepancies in healthcare between different populations in this country and rectify that. I can't think of anything that we're more committed to and that's more important. To One you. in four of us will die of heart disease, so it's important for all of us to make sure that we lift each other up. Yeah, I think after seeing a procedure like this, it, I think it makes everyone feel a little more comfortable about what's going on, because it's not opening the heart up as we, we're so used to. You know, it's now just a very easy procedure there. And, and you're saying that this patient will be able to pretty much be back out there and, and to really work on um, making sure they don't have to be back in here. Absolutely. This gentleman should be out of the hospital today. He'll be sitting up uh, nearly immediately after uh, this procedure. And then he's going to follow up uh, with Dr. Shaw in the office and all of the important things about cholesterol reduction and making sure his blood sugars are uh, excellent and that he's in cardiac rehabilitation and exercise program for 12 weeks. There's a, this is only the beginning. There's a number of steps after this for maintenance of health. Well, wow, it's amazing. Well, doctor, again, you and your team uh, have made someone, again, n love life and, and be able to go do things with their families and stuff. Well, I want to thank this whole team in here, all of our clinical support from Siemens, from Abbott's, from Shockwave, all the different groups that have um, helped to uh, support uh, uh, us doing these live cases. And it's always a pleasure to work with this guy. Oh, it's pretty <laughs> nice to so see you guys again. There you are, another procedure done. Uh, thanks to Dr. Rizek and his wonderful team. Mm -hmm.